All right. Um, if you checked your email, um, I sent you an email and uh, let you note that I've put some more questions in the folder. So it has um, some additional sample questions. Uh, and then I also put in um, the two exams uh, from, the, from the last two times that I taught the exam number one. So you can look at those, and the questions on the midterm will look a lot like, if not identical to, um, at least the essay questions uh, will look a lot like the sample questions. Um, so you'll see that the sample questions are divided. Should have been looking at this already, I suppose. Um, but you'll see the sample questions are divided by uh, chapters two through five is one set of them. So that's what's going to be on the, the midterm is we're going to go up through chapter five. So anyway, um, make sure that you look at, the, uh, at those sample questions because the essay questions that you'll get are going to look a lot like that. So um, any, any questions on that part? No? Okay, so again, um, what I'm going to tr try to do for the review session is I'm going to try to um, do a Zoom of that. I've been doing a Zoom for the 11 o'clock class, which has worked much of the time, um, not all the time. Uh, so anyway, uh, I will try to, uh, try to have that zoomed if there are people that are in quarantine or that aren't going to be able to make it. There's uh, a couple folks that um, aren't going to be able to take the exam in, cl in class, so I've got a mechanism to deal with that. So um, just to let you know if, there's, uh, if you get quarantined, hopefully you won't, um, that uh, we'll, we have a mechanism to, to handle that. All right? Um, the uh, band pick of the week is, uh, is an indie band. Um, called Rolling Blackouts Coastal Fever. Um, how many have heard of, okay. Um, well, the, uh, they're a band out of Australia. They're from Melbourne. And there are three, um, three singer, uh, lead, basically singer guitarists. And they got together around 2013. Uh, they've had a, two albums, I think. Uh, so anyway, you might, you might try, to, try to listen to them. So they're, the, they're the, an indie rock, indie rock genre. So uh, anyway, they're from Australia. You might take a look at that. All right. Um, so last time we were looking at uh, what you can do with your property. And we we're talking about bequests. Uh, and inheritances, and uh, we were closing with this issue of uh, can you say I'm giving this property to my uh, daughter, uh, but she's got to keep it as we were mentioning last time uh, a feral cat facility for you know forever. Okay. Um, well, it turns out that if you sort of think about that. Um, if you did that, how would you know that 80 years from now, that's the best use of the property, right? I mean, if you're sort of thinking about what are we trying to do, trying to make sure that um, we're uh, making the law so uh, properties used in the most efficient manner, right? We try to get it Pareto optimal, that, you know, talking about that, and that the property goes to the people who value it the most, et cetera. We we're trying, talking about reducing uh, the cost of bargaining and et cetera. So uh, if you have, uh, there's a thing we, we mentioned last time, a, a rule against perpetuities that says that lives in being plus 21 years. So if I gave it to my daughter and said, this has got to be used for a feral cat facility, um, that would last until she died plus 21 years, okay? So you can't just uh, uh, do things f forever. And again, we could see why you might have it. Now, is that the right amount of time? Who knows, right? 
But if you sort of think about it, there are, it makes some sense to have a rule about you can bequest, you can give your property away uh, because it's your property, but from an, an efficiency standpoint, you wouldn't want to have it so that, it's, that you say this has got to be used this way forever. Because who knows, maybe they won't even have feral cats, you know, 30 years from now. Um, something happened to the feral cat population, so there's no more feral cats, right? Or we find some sort of innovative way to, to deal with feral cats so they don't exist anymore. Uh, so you want to have, uh, you have, it makes sense to have some limitation. Again, um, what that exact limitation is, you know, you, you got to look at the benefits and the costs. Um, if uh, there's rules against it, then you may use the property up, right? Or you might, uh, you, you might do something to try to circumvent uh, this, this rule against perpetuity. So there's a, you know, there's a, you know, we've created incentives for people to try to bypass that. Now, one way that, that people try to deal with rules about bequesting things are trusts. And um, there's a whole set of trust laws. And what they are, uh, basically there's a mechanism uh, to manipulate property. And if you just sort of, what a trust does is the trust then owns the property. So you set up this entity, which is called a trust, and you can have revocable trusts and irrevocable trusts. A revocable trust says, mm, you can change who the trustees are. So the trust is the thing that owns the property, and uh, the trustees decide what to do with it. This is a pretty complicated law. Um, there are certainly uh, law firms, uh, there's one out of Jackson that that's, that's all they do. They just specialize in trusts. Um, and there's uh, several things that you can try to, try to do it. Um, one way is to avoid probate. And what probate is, just to give you an idea, what probate is, is when you die and you leave a will, um, then what happens is the, the uh, property goes into a judge, probate judge, and they have to figure out you know, exactly what the property is and where it goes and that kind of stuff. And of course, that has costs, right? You, you have costs of litigation, et cetera. So what, what you might wanna do is make it so that it doesn't go into probate because the trust owns, let's say, our house, my wife and my house, okay? So the trust owns the house. But we're the trustees so that we can determine what's going to happen to the house, right? Um, and so the, uh, when, when we die, we have these successor trustees who are our children, okay? Uh, and then they can determine as the successor trustees what happens to the house, okay? So again, it's... Um, there, uh, one, one way to, why you would do that is to avoid uh, legal uh, restrictions or the legal costs of dealing with the transfer of title, et cetera. But there is no transfer of title when, when my, my wife and I die because it's the trust that owns the house. It just changes who the trustees are. So again, it's, it's fairly complicated, but another thing uh, that, that uh, you'll see advertising about um, is to uh, avoid, in, avoid taxes, inheritance tax. And again, from uh, if you've, when we had Ecom 402, we talk about inheritance tax, but, um, but the bottom line is there's all sorts of um, reasons uh, to, um, to, to deal with this, but the, the, the trust is, a, the whole trust law is relatively complicated, but the basic idea is, is that the law was created to make it so that you could deal with your property 
and in particular, deal with your property once you die, okay? And so you can, uh, 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 if, you know, again, uh, I think I mentioned that one of my, uh, you know, one of our students, Carl Miller, uh, his paper that he did for Law and Economics uh, just got published. Um, so maybe, you know, if you decided you want to do something on trust as your paper or whatever, um, you can. But the bottom line is uh, the, the, it's a mechanism to manipulate property. Now, what about using someone else's property? Anybody ever know anybody that's had a trust or hear about that? Okay, yeah. Um, the, uh, it's, it, uh, again, a, a, an irrevocable trust says you can't switch who the trustees are, but a revocable trust is. So if I get irritated with one of my kids, I can just go, uh, eh, you're not a trustee anymore, okay? Um, all right, um, so what can you use someone else's property? You know, um, again, this is a, a, just topics, that, that this chapter is called topics, right? We've talked about all these things before, but here's a particular instance to deal with that. Um, one is, what if, you have an emergency. Let's say you're lo lost and uh, you know, you've been out deer hunting uh, and you get lost and there's a storm comes up, et cetera, and you come across this cabin. Uh, can you break into the cabin and you know, shelter down? Um, and what has to happen if you do, right? So one of the, the, uh, one of the law, the way the law works, is that if in an emergency you use, and then you have to compensate the owner. So if you, uh, you know, if you use their gas or something like that, whatever. If if what happens is you you there's an emergency and you then use the property, then whatever the you you know if you uh, did something that, that used up the property a little bit, or there was some, something that we had to compensate uh, the owner, then you compensate the owner. And if you sort of think about it, why would you have it so that you could actually go into that cabin? You don't have permission from the owner because you don't know who the owner is, but you go, why would we have it that you get to use the cabin right away? What's, what's the problem in terms of what we're always talking about um, what and the, the Coase theorem is about, right? Coase or Hobbes, which, is this a normative Hobbes issue or a Coase issue? It's a normative Hobbes transaction cost, so if you're trying to communicate with somebody to rent their cabin, it's enormously high if you're about to die. Exactly. You've got transactions costs here, right? This is a normative Hobbes problem here, right? Yeah, there's, there's high trans, you, you, even if you knew who owned the cabin, of course, there didn't used to be cell phones, right? Um, but maybe you're up in the UP and there's no, uh, there's no cell phone reception or something, right? So even if you knew who it was, it might be hard to bargain, right? So the transactions costs are, ha are high. So what do you want to do? We're going to say, okay, who values, it the mo who values the use of that cabin today the most, right? You or the owner of the cabin? You probably do, because you're freezing to death, and the owner of the cabin is down in Florida, okay? So that's why you would have uh, this uh, uh, right to use someone else's pr property in terms of the emergency, right? Now, uh, there m m maybe it might be difficult to figure out, for the owner to actually figure out that you used the property, and you should try to figure out who the owner is, but how you actually implement the statute, implement the law, you know, there's some difficulties in doing that, but you could see that it makes sense to say you can't get arrested for breaking into that cabin if it's an emergency, or let's say you had to, somebody left their keys in the car and you're, you know, you're, uh, uh, you know, your child just got, uh, you know, you don't have a car and your child uh, is uh, having a heart attack or something, you know, you could think of some sort of story that would say, oh, 
you could use that car and then compensate the owner of the car uh, for doing that. So, you know, just basically it's an emergency use issue and you can see it's a transactions cost issue. Um, what about what's called inalienability in terms of property use? That is, are there some things you can't do with your property? You can't do with your own property. And the example that's normally used is some sort of conventional morality. Like, can you sell your kidney? Anybody know if you can sell your kidney? You don't know? Ever tried to sell your kidney? Um, turns out you can't sell your kidney, <laughs> okay? Um, why is that? Uh, the, it may be there's some sort of moral sense that says you're a real poor person uh, and uh, you're out there and you sell your kidney to somebody, okay? And then your other kidney goes bad and you end up dying. Um, so there are, and, and, and it, uh, there are some issues where they say, oh, and um, can you sell your blood, right? Have you, do you ever see an ad where it says, we need blood, $5 a liter, come on in, right? Doesn't say that. What do they say? What do they want you to do with your blood? Donate. Yeah, you want to donate your blood, right? So you can't sell your blood. Um, can you sell your children? Evidently not, right? Not in the United States, at least not in Michigan. Uh, you can't sell your children. So there are certain issues of what we might think of, uh, you know, moral uh, or um, other I issues that would preclude you from doing that. Maybe you come up with some uh, idea that, that there, the incentive structure is going to be wrong. Uh, you're going to be, uh, um, there's some other reason, but primarily we sort of think about it as a, uh, a moral issue. Uh, and sometimes the idea is that uh, donations, that if, uh, if you sell your blood, maybe you would go out and uh, you've got HIV, right? But you don't tell anybody you got the HIV or whatever. Um, so uh, now, of course, they probably test for all that stuff. But the bottom line is the idea is that you, uh, there, the incentives may be such that you'd rather have it done through a donation than done through, uh, done through the sale of it. Um, another issue is can you unbundle the rights? And we've talked about this already, right? That is, remember that we said property, you get a, property's what? It's a bunch of rights that you have. Okay, um, and so can you unbundle these rights? And we talked about, for example, um, my paper on the sale of development rights. Right, can I, can I unbundle uh, the right to uh, build a house. So we have a, where we live, there's a church that's down below us. Um, and so we get this, uh, you know, this uh, open space uh, view from our house. So how could I preserve that open space view from the house? Well, I could buy the property from the church, okay? But maybe I don't want to do anything with the property. I just want it just to sit there. Should I be able to just buy the right to develop it away from the church and they get to keep the property? You know, and they can walk on the property, do whatever they want. They just can't build another house on it or they can't uh, develop it, right? So it would, if, if, uh, it, it, if it adds value to be able to take out this property right, uh, the, if the value to me of just the development right is sufficiently high, then maybe the church would just sell me the right to develop and they get to, and they want to keep the property, um, then you could do that. Uh, agricultural property, you could, you, maybe you want to say, hey, um, 
I want to keep the, you know, I like looking at this view of the cornfields. Uh, how about I uh, buy the right to do anything but grow corn on your property away from you? So the sale of development rights um, can uh, create, uh, create a, uh, an ability to bargain, right? An ability to do a transaction. Now, um, it might increase the value of the property because I can now, the, the unbundled rights are worth more than the property itself because I could sell this right to this person over here. I could sell that, the uh, other right to this person over here, right? And I could sell this other right to this person over here. So I might be able to add up those values and it's greater than if I just kept the rights in the one piece of property because I got more people to sell it to. Maybe, I mean, for example, I don't want to buy the land, okay? But I might be willing to buy that property right to the land. And there might be somebody else that, you know, the development right. There might be somebody else that might want to be able to buy this bundle of rights that goes with it. Um, the question is, can, is, is it, and maybe it's hard to reassemble those rights. Sort of think about it. Now somebody comes along and they want to put a subdivision in, and it's really valuable for them to get the subdivision. Now what's happened? They got to buy this right from this person over here, and this right from this person over here, and this right from this person over here. So you can see, just again, there's always a trade-off. And what do you have to do? You have to think through and say, okay, what's the benefits of doing it this way? What's the cost? And try to figure out whether it's obvious or not or whether it's close, um, and, uh, and, and again, there's always some sort of, or usually there's some sort of uh, benefit and cost issue that you have to, uh, have to deal with. Um, what about remedies for the violation of uh, property rights, okay? So somebody violates your property right, okay? So what about remedy? And again, we've already talked about, um, let's say, remedy for violation. And we've already talked about several of these. One is we've already talked about externalities, right? We said, what is a, an externality? Uh, that's where your use of your property um, affects my use of the pro uh, my property uh, and the price system isn't picking it up. Okay, we have a party uh, and you're making noise at midnight or one o'clock in the morning and you got the apartment next to mine and uh, what, what, what do you do with that? Um, and uh, this is sometimes called nuisance in, if you look at the law, you've created a nuisance, okay? Your, uh, uh, you know, your, most, most cities or municipalities or whatever have noise ordinances, okay? In fact, the city, um, Hillsdale College uh, had to go to the city of Hillsdale to get a, um, uh, an exception to the noise ordinance to have, you know, some big event that they were going to have, okay? Uh, Hollapalooza or whatever they, you know, had last year. Okay, so you may have noise ordinance, and why, why would you have a noise ordinance? To deal with a nuisance, which is there's some externality going on, uh, and so you're restricting uh, the, the use of, the, um, of this person's property because it's, a, it's costing the other person's property. And so what do you want, you know, when we think back to it, what do you want to do? You, you want to assign the property right to the one who values it the most, okay? So if you, if you have this, uh, uh, ability to, um, to get an exception to the ordinance, the city council or whoever makes that decision, planning and zoning commission, whoever makes that decision, what do you do? You try to go in and argue that we value it more than the other folks, okay? Or we will do something to compensate the other folks, right? We'll invite them all, okay? Everybody can come to Hollapalooza, right? Um, and so, uh, again, you just sort of need, uh, need to, to think about that. And we just talked about when transactions costs are low, um, then you can have it. And we already talked about this, right? 
as we said, when you have low transactions costs, then what? You'd, you'd have an injunction. You can't make the noise, okay? Because then what can happen? Hillsdale College could buy, you, could pay you to say, hey, don't, don't have the injunction. I'm going to buy that away from you, right? So uh, if you, you know, because the person could, could, could it, it creates a property right, right? The injunction's basically created a property right. And if transactions costs are low, then it'll get, uh, it'll get traded around. Um, if uh, we said that if transactions costs are high, then we said, what, damages are, then you might want to choose damages. And why is that? Because if you have compensatory damages, which match the cost to the person that, um, that is having the externality imposed on them, okay, then you could choose to go ahead and hold the party and pay the damages. This is the value to you of having the party is greater than the, the cost to the person that's got it. So you avoid the issue of transaction cost. You, you get to decide, okay, I'm just gonna pay compensatory damages. Now, um, what happens if you start looking at compensatory damages? Okay, so we already sort of brought that up before, and now in this chapter we're looking at, let's, let's look at the compensatory damages a little more closely. Well, first of all, can you get compensated just for past harm? Whatever you're doing with your property, can uh, you sue me, uh, or uh, whatever I'm doing with my property, and it's imposing an extra cost on you, right? And so you sue me for that, and then I compensate you for the damages that I did before. That makes some sense, but what's the problem? The problem is you have to keep litigating, right? Suppose I do it again next week, right? And then I do it again next week, and then I do it again next week, okay? Whatever I'm doing, hap or, or if I'm, whatever I'm doing has a continuous uh, issue to it, like drying corn, right? So I'm, I'm doing it for three weeks. Okay. Do you wait until the end of the third week and then sue me? But what happens if I do it next year? And I do, I do it every year. Every year you gotta come in and sue for that. Right? So you could, have, um, you could have you just get compensated for past damages, but then I gotta keep litigating. Or you could sue for past and present, or excuse me, past and future. So what we do, you'd look for what? The present discounted value. Of the future damages. So I know that you're gonna be drying your corn every year, okay? So what could we say? We could say, okay, you're gonna keep your corn drying machine there. Here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna figure out what the, um, present discounted value of those costs are in the future. Well, you can see that there's a number of problems uh, uh, about that. One is that the, um, you don't, you've reduced the, the costs of suing people, right? Because they have to sue you every year. But what's the chances I'm gonna get that present discounted value right? Again, if you think about just a number of things, right, to think back to how you do present discounted value, what's, what do you need to know to do present discounted value? Suppose I know what the stream of, 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 of something is, a stream of income or the stream of cost. How do I turn that into a present value? Yeah. You know the rate of inflation. Yeah, or the interest rate. Right? I gotta know what the interest rate, because why is it called present discounted value, right? You discount it by the interest rate. So what are some problems 
sort of think about what sort of the problems with this would be um, you have to get the interest rate correct. And we don't know that the Federal Reserve is going to set interest rates near zero. Or if you're in Germany, you set it negative, right? So how do you deal with negative interest rates, right? So somehow you got to guess what the, uh, uh, what the interest rates are. And um, what, sort of, uh, uh, what sort of innovations are going to happen in the future? Right? Suppose there's going to be something that comes along and now the corn drying machines don't make any noise, you know, 15 years from now or 10 years from now. Then you'll have gotten the present discounted value of the future. You think they're going to, let's say, 30 years, they're going to keep drying corn for 30 years. And how long do you know that they're going to keep drying the corn? Again, it's not like there's a set Here's the, here's the five things that, that you could get wrong, right? You just, you just got to think through, oh, what could I get wrong? I mean, an obvious thing is that, uh, getting the interest rate wrong. An obvious thing is that um, there's innovations that reduce that f uh, future uh, transact, there's future, um, uh, there's f future uh, innovations that will reduce the harm. Um, maybe, the, maybe everybody that owns the property is deaf now. Uh, right, and you can just sort of think of things that would affect what that is, but but that's that's the point is is that okay if we do it future, I've reduced the cost of having to litigate every year, but what have I you know what's the the likelihood that I'm I'm going to get those that uh, compensation uh, correct? So it probably has some sort of uh, high error rate. Um, now. Uh, with liability, the transactions costs are lower, um, and, uh, uh, and, and, and you know what the, the, the uh, liability is certain. Um, so you have to sort of figure out which thing is, basically, if you're going to use past damages only or future damages, you just got to think through what are the costs, right? And what's, what, what's, what's the certainty that, that you have, uh, if, if, you, if, you, if for some reason you know the error rate is small and figuring out what the present discounted value of the future costs are, then do it that way. Uh, if you're uncertain and you think that certainty is greater than the additional litigation costs, then, uh, then you uh, uh, choose appropriately. Um, what about takings by the government? What should you do about takings? Can the government come along and take your property? And if it does, how does that work? Well, we sort of know that the Constitution tells us, we all had Constitution 101. That they talk about takings in your Constitution class at all? They don't? Oh, well, there you go. Um, anyway, if you read your Constitution, what happens? The government can take your property for what? Anybody know? Really? They can take it for public use. All right? That's what your Constitution says. They can take your property for public use, but what do they have to do? They have to give you just compensation. So, if we want to build a road, what's, what, is a, what, what is a problem in building the road that you have to deal with? Well, what we call the holdout problem. Suppose that you got a road going along here, right? You want to build a, you want to build a uh, highway, right? So you want to build this highway, put a little line here. I want to build this highway, and so I got to buy this property owner's property, and I got to buy that property owner's property, and that property owner's property, and that property owner's property, because they all go up to where we were going to put the road. Okay. So, what will happen? You will hold out, right? And because what's going to happen? Let's say there's 
uh, a certain uh, dollar amount of value to having the, the road there. Uh, and they're uh, selling, everybody's selling a piece of property. If you're the last one, you may be able to be a holdout and you're the last one, you may be able to capture most of the value of having the road, right? Because we now, re you, we really need your piece of property. So everybody has an incentive to be the holdout. And so in order to avoid that situation, what did we do? We put into the constitution that says, the government can take your property to build the road, right? Because it's public use. And, but it's got to give you just compensation. So, you got two issues here. Public use and what's just compensation, right? So, what is the, uh, 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 let's, let's think about what the compensation is. Look, if, if you didn't have compensation, then what the government could do is just take your property and use it to, and then sell it to finance the government, right? See, so if you if you didn't have if you didn't have compensation, the, the government just take your property for public use. Then what would you what you might get is that's the way the government finances its activities. And this is going to be much less efficient than broad-based taxes. So you don't want to do you don't want to just let the you don't want to just let the government go ahead and take the property away. Okay? So that's why just compensation is sitting in there. Now, um, wh what happens about the, uh, the issue is your value, you may value the property different than the market value. Okay. So what is just compensation? It generally has been just compensation is the market value. So the market value of your house is $200,000. You know, we go out and you go to uh, Zillow or whatever. Uh, we find out what the what what the market value of your property is. It's two hundred thousand dollars, and they pay you the two hundred thousand. Well, what's the problem? What happens if you have you value the property at three hundred thousand? Right? You got consumer surplus, right? There's you know, if you look at a demand curve, what's going on? Right? The people that uh, there are people on the upper end of the demand curve, the equilibrium price is here, right? Everybody on the upper part of the demand curve has consumer surplus. So what might happen is that you might value, you value it more than the market value. So um, that's a problem, right? Uh, and again, uh, we're, we're looking at the benefits and costs and no, no, noticing what the, uh, what, what the problems are. Now, so that's, that's the problem on the comp or a part. And again, you can think of other reason, other problems that would develop, but those are, but that's an, that's, that's an obvious thing is I'm going to give you just compensation, but how do we figure out what that just compensation is? What if you have a unique property? Okay, uh, the government is gonna is gonna take your property and it's it's unique property. How do you determine what the market value of that piece of property is? And again, if you uh, you know in other classes you may have talked about uh, problems with uh, unique properties. Uh, how do you value what a you know what Michael Jordan's uh, house is worth? Okay, I don't know if you I just I just saw a thing on Michael Jordan's house. Um, it's got all sorts of things. Uh, it was like some show about, you know, lifestyles of the rich and famous or something like that and just happened to be going through and 
So I said, well, that's really interesting. But anyway, um, how do we know what the, I mean, how many people are out there trying to buy Michael Jordan's house, right? It's not like uh, uh, hot dogs or something where you sort of know what, this, is the, this is the market value. So how do you deal with unique properties? And of course, in public, uh, uh, public finance, we talk about, and when we talk about property taxation, that's one of the things that you have to, you have to uh, look at. So, but what about the issue of public use? Okay. What about this public use problem? What is a public use? Well, there's sort of a famous uh, decision called uh, Kilo versus the City of New London. And the issue was, could the, could the government, uh, the City of New London, could it take your property and either give it or uh, sell it to another person if it increases economic development, right? Um, could you take the property and give or sell to another private owner if it increases economic development. And in a five to four decision, it said, yes, you could do that. Well, it's, this was an interesting case um, because this case cited what's called the Pole Town case. Just Informationally, um, it cited a Michigan case called Pole Town, where the city of Detroit took property to give to General Motors because it would add to economic development. Right. So General Motors wanted to build this plant, rather, and and they said, okay, this is a public use in the sense that we're going to increase economic development in the city of Detroit. And so we're going to take these people's properties, we're going to give them just compensation, and then we're going to go ahead and sell it to, or give it, they actually gave it to General Motors to build a, to build a plant. This was overturned. So it gets cited as a, one of the reasons to allow this to happen, but the Michigan case was overturned. Uh, uh, later on in, uh, called it the County of Wayne versus Hathcock. So in the County of Wayne versus Hathcock, um, it was overturned. So individual states may react and say, hey, you can't do that in Michigan, okay? Um, you know, we're going to say that we're going to have a statute that says that, that, that we're not going to allow the state to, the state or the city uh, or a municipality to take your property uh, if, if what it's doing is it's uh, for just simply economic development. Could we come along and just say, hey, you haven't been using this property forever. Um, we're going to take it and pay you the little bit that we think this current market value of that property is and, and get rid of it. Um, what about what we've, we, you know, what we've been talking about with regulations and zoning, right? We said that, we said, what do these things do, right? They solve externality problems or an attempt, attempt to solve an externality issue. Well, uh, again, what's an what's a, uh, a, uh, extra thing to think about in this? Um, when is this a takings, right? And we have to compensate. So could I say, hey, um, you change the zoning, I've, you know, I've got this piece of property, um, and then the city changes the zoning. 
And when it changes the zoning, it makes it so that I can't do things with my property that I thought I could do with, right? You've sort of taken away part of the bundle of rights. Do you have to compensate me and say, oh, my property's now worth less because I've got this, uh, this change in the, in the zoning? So again, um, you have to sort of think through the benefits and costs and how do you want to set your statute up? How do you want to set the law up? Do you want to say, no, zoning is simply an externality issue. We know who values the property, uh, we, uh, who, who values that property right the most. We're going to assign it to these people. Uh, or could I make it so that I could, uh, I could, you know, buy that zoning right away? Do you want to allow you to, uh, again, have uh, uh, a, a uh, uh, you get an exception to the zoning rule or something like that? How do you want to structure the thing? And of course, that all comes down back again to information costs, right? And, and, uh, and um, transactions costs. Do I, know, uh, do I know the relative value of these things, et cetera? So how do you want to treat zoning? If you, what you have to do is you have to compensate, right? You're going to get less zoning, aren't you? You're going to, have get, you're going to, get, going to get less government regulation if every time that we do that, then we have to, to compensate the, the, the point. And then lastly, um, questioning about do you offset or do you mitigate? And this is a, an issue of you can, you, you, um, you're doing something with your property that is uh, imposing a harm on the public. Um, do you have to uh, mitigate the harm? That is, you say, okay, er, can't do what I was doing with it. Okay. So the so the issue is, you know, whatever you, you, your use of the property is um, harming the public. So we say, okay, you have to mitigate, right? That says mm, you have to stop whatever you were doing. Maybe you, uh, uh, the example that they use in the book is you have a, uh, you're obstructing the view by, of the people of the lake or something like that uh, by doing something with your house, the way you've structured your house, okay? So what you could do is say, ah, uh, you got you to uh, change that so you're no longer obstructing the view, okay? Whatever you're doing, not gonna, you're not going to be able to do that. Now, um, what if you instead you donate something of greater value, that is, you offset it, but instead, instead of mitigating, You donate something of greater value, but it costs you less than the mitigation. And you can see this, we, you know, you keep coming back to looking at just sort of thinking through the thing, now it wouldn't be most efficient. So if you sort of thought about it, let's say you have done something with your property which reduces uh, the public value by $400, okay? Um, and the cost to you of mitigating is uh, $500. What you might do is donate something worth $450, right? In the, you know, in the example in the book, I think they build a, you know, you build a pathway or something like that so people can go, go down to the lake or whatever. So instead of mitigating what you're doing, you say, okay, let me do this, but here's what I'll do. I'll, I'll donate something that's of greater value than the, the, the lost value to you of what I'm doing. And if the mitigation costs are higher than what the donation is, then, you, then that's what you would do. Right? So again, we're sort of 
coming back to the same idea that if it costs less to do it this way, then the benefits to the people that are being reimbursed are, are greater than uh, the uh, added cost of this person, then, then, then we ought to uh, go, go ahead and, and to do it because it allows the property owner to make this, you, you could have either you mitigate, I mean, think through, you could either have it, you gotta mitigate, or you could uh, 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 donate something of greater value that is, you could offset and you could say, ah, the donor, or excuse me, the, the, the property owner gets to decide what they want to do. Could you require them to mitigate? Could you require them to offset? Or could you require them to do either, right? And they make the choice. All right, um, so uh, basically we've now finished chapter five. And that's what we're gonna cover for the midterm. Uh, so we will start on uh, Wednesday, we'll start chapter six. Uh, again, be sure to look at the old, the old questions, the essay questions in particular. Um, like I said, the sample questions in two to five, I put the additional sample questions, and then go back and look at the old, uh, the old first midterms, all right?